Good morning. I love the book of Colossians, and I love preaching out of the book of Colossians, and I always feel like Paul saved some of the best stuff for last in the book of Colossians. Up to this point in our series, and this is the last week, talking about Christ above all. Up to this point, we've talked about Christ above all in ways that you could treat as impersonal or even impractical. Christ is above all the creation. Christ is above all human ideas and philosophies. Christ is above all rivals. Those are all intensely practical. But if you want, I mean, you could kind of push them down and, and keep them out of your daily life if you want to. So it's not accidental that at the end of the book of Colossians, chapter 3 and 4 are entirely dedicated to practical comments about life, morality, good, bad choices, behaviors, habits, because Paul is not going to let them keep this in their heads and not in their life. All of us, I won't say all of us, vast majority of us, I'll just say me, how about that? I am perfectly happy most of the time to acknowledge that Christ is above all. With one tiny exception, there is one little piece of the universe that I tend not to recognize the Lordship of Christ. I'm fine when God says that He is the God of creation. I'm fine that He's the Lord of galaxies and radiation and particles and, and governments and states and nations and policies. I'm even fine that He's actually the Lord of all of you people. Right? There's one little corner of the universe I would prefer he wasn't in charge of, and that is myself and what I want. Inside my own head, I like to pretend that Christ is not Lord there. Everywhere else, all the time, but not there, not over what I want. And so today, we want to talk about Christ being above all desires and start out with a fairly simple recognition. That's not going to surprise anyone, nothing profound this morning. I am happy when I get what I want. Anybody disagree so far? Right? As a general rule, that's kind of what we think happiness is. Um, I'm trying to be a good dad and tell less stories about Lucas now that he's old enough to pay attention to my sermons. I don't like embarrassing him. But this one is pretty good, so I'll tell it anyway. When Lucas was about five, I can't remember what it was we were arguing about, but he didn't get something that he really badly wanted. And at five, precocious as he was, folded his little arms, looked at Celine and I and said, I'm going to invent a machine that makes people do what I want. I was frightened because I felt like the, the face, like it made me think he could do it. And I didn't know how that would turn. But that's just your most basic primal human thinking, right? We're all pretty sure that life is about making ourselves happy and being satisfied in some way, however we define it. And we're all pretty sure that what makes me happy is me getting whatever I want all the time. Paul's going to challenge every part of that assumption with a set of better questions. We ask, how can Christ above all ever make me happy? See, we ask, how is it possible if step one of this religion thing you're talking about is submitting my own desires and wills and wishes and plans to someone else, never mind that he's the Lord of the universe and Savior of my soul, but it means if it means submitting what I want to somebody else, how can I ever be happy if you're telling me step one is, Ben, you don't get what you want? Paul's going to go further. He's going to remind us, what if I don't know what makes me happy? See, that's built into that assumption. Assumption number one in that statement is my happiness is the sum total of my life, which may or may not be true. Sermon for another day. But even if it is, even if I grant to you that you being happy is the grand total meaning of your life, are you actually sure you know what would make you happy? That if right now I could grant you everything you wanted, you would be content you would be satisfied and happy. It would all go, I mean, some of you are chuckling to yourself, you know better. You know how many things you've wanted in life and gotten. 
and later thought, well, that was a terrible idea. We've all read the stories. I mean, the kind of the, the laboratory experiment in real life of this question is lottery winners, and we've all seen the stories, the statistics of how many lottery winners end up both broke and in mental distress and crisis for the rest of their lives. I mean, that's the equivalent. We assume the American dream is I can have whatever I want. It's kind of the same as get whatever I want. So here's all the money you could ever need. Put it in your bank. Do whatever you want. Nobody can tell you what to do. And they're all happy, right? And of course, the answer is no. Well, it's universally. They're miserable. And it should cause us to think, maybe ask some better questions. What if I don't actually know what I want? What if I don't know what will make me happy? What if I'm going about this all wrong? And so turning to Colossians, we'll start in chapter 3 where we left off last week, verses 1 through 2. And this comes at the end of chapter 2 where Paul has been listing you know, all the ideas that shape our lives, our philosophies, our religions, our everything that shapes the way we behave. And at the end of that he says, "...if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above." where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. First observation Paul's going to point out is, first thing I want to say about Paul's statement is that these are commands. These are imperative statements. Seek is a command. Set your mind is a command which indicates that Paul thinks you have some say in this. We often don't question our desires. And, and I'll even admit, actually, as a, as a young preacher, I used, to, I used to believe that your desires were just hardwired in. Like that's whatever it is you want is just plugged into the hardware. It's programmed into who you are. And then your job as a Christian was probably to resist those desires. Okay? And that's not entirely false. But when you look, in, look at passages like this, what Paul seems to say is actually different. He seems to say you actually have some say in the matter. You have a choice in your affections and desires. You can shape and alter what you want. What you want changes. Which is, by the way, one of the reasons basing your life on what you want is such a terrible idea. Because what you want, even if you're not a Christian, even if you're not trying to kind of shape something in a godly way, what you want will change throughout your life. If you're not sure, find somebody older than you in the room and ask them, is what you want in life right now the same thing you wanted 10 and 20 years ago? And they're going to tell you no. Their goals are different. Values are different. Things have changed. What Paul is telling us that our affections, our desires, our wants, our attention, our thoughts, not only can they change, they are changing. They change all the time. Most of what the world does is to shape our desires in one direction. Every commercial you've ever seen, every advertising you've ever seen has had a goal to shape your desire towards something they're selling. And I'm not blaming them. That's their job. And we buy their stuff and it works, right? That, that, clearly the system, uh, that's the way it's designed. But they show you an advertisement, some guy in a truck, and he looks happy. And it tells you, wow, man, if I had that truck, I'd be happy. And suddenly now I want a truck. Can I tell you an embarrassing story about me buying my first truck? It's embarrassing for me, so you'll enjoy it. I was uh, moving my sister-in-law, and I had never been a truck guy. Never been a truck guy. I always drove a little sedan. Drove a Dodge Dynasty in high school. I was really cool. Uh, never been a truck guy. But I was moving my sister-in-law, and um, we needed a truck. So I went down and I rented a big truck. You know, big, like manly, in the commercial truck. And I pulled up to the little self-storage in my truck, and Celine was there, and Celine said, you look good in that truck. I bought a truck the next week. <laughs> Not kidding. I bought that exact model and color. 
Don't tell me your desires can't be shaped and changed and influenced. Things people say to you, things that you experience, they shape what you want and what you think will make you happy. It happens all the time. Paul says, how about we do it on purpose? How about instead of letting it happen to you, you set your affections higher up. You think about things that matter instead of constantly being drugged down to think about these things that matter so little. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Put to death therefore what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Paul loves a good list. He says, here's the kind of things I'm talking about and these things are killing you. These things are bad for you. These things are in the place in your life where the higher things ought to be. That's the last word in that list. It's kind of fascinating. It goes through the sexual stuff and then the covetous stuff. And then he says, which is idolatry. He doesn't say, oh, and also keep from idols. He says, these are your idols. These are the things you have put in the heart of your affections where God should be. These are the things that are destroying you. He says, your true self is actually Christ, not the person you have been. These things that you've been doing, he says, let's have a reality check just for a minute. Did any of them make you happy? For a moment, you enjoyed everything he listed, right? There was, and, and we have a great power as humans. We have a great gift for rewriting our own history. And we look back and, oh, those were the good old days. And we forget all the misery woven in through all of it. Paul says, those things were killing you. So how about instead of letting them kill you, you kill them. Put to death that version of you. Modern man is convinced that I need to look down deep inside me and find my true self. And when I find my true self and what my true self wants, I'll be liberated and happy and I can be all that I intend to be in life. Paul says, that person down there is terrible. <laughs> That person down inside of you is not the best version of you. That's the person stealing from you the joy that is in Christ Jesus. Don't be that person. Be someone else. Be Christ. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, seen talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. Paul is so clever. He loves a good list. The first list was stuff we enjoyed doing. Second list, any of these things fun? Anger, wrath, malice, slander. Any of these enjoyable? If I say that uh, your home today, you're going to go home from church, and your home will be filled with anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk. Anyone excited to go home today? I mean, those things aren't fun. They aren't enjoyable. And we somehow forget that all of those things get woven in with all the other things. That when we look at the worst set of affections we have for ourselves, we get more than we bargained for. He says it's all got to go. And it's all got to go together. The gratification, the personal idols and covetousness, and all the bickering and fighting and hating that comes with it. Because here's what happens. You think making yourself happy will make you happy. You're not happy. So you start looking around for who to blame. Clearly, I, this plan must work. Doing whatever I want should make me happy and I'm not happy. It's clearly your fault. Maybe you've got something that I want or you're in the way of some desire that I think I need. You must be the problem. It couldn't be me. And so after we chase our desires, the follow-up is always the fighting, the bickering, the anger, the outrage, because we're trying to cover up for the fact that getting everything we wanted still didn't make us happy. Paul says, I've got a better idea. Kill it. None of those things were good for you. Nothing good comes from your old self. That version of you was not happy. That version of you is not happy. That version of you will never be happy. Nothing but misery down that road. Paul says the only answer, we can't fix it. We can't build it better. 
We have to get rid of it. It's beyond repair. We need a different version of you with a different set of affections and desires. And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. There is a true version of you. There is a true version of you that can be satisfied in life. But you don't find it by looking deep inside. You find it by looking up. My class I'm going to be teaching on Wednesday nights coming up borrows some material from uh, C.S. Lewis, and so I've been refreshing myself on mere Christianity and going back and flipping through pages I've read a dozen times now probably in life. And uh, I, there's one section that always gets me, and it, it just it's so clear and thoughtful. <laughs> he says, it's not that God won't give you happiness apart from himself. It's that there's no such thing. Right now, your car runs on gasoline, which is extraordinarily expensive. Have you ever lectured your car? How dare you require gasoline to go? Why can't you just get me where I want to go without gasoline? No, you don't do that. Why? Because cars run on gasoline. It's not the car's fault. It's what they're made to do. If you don't put the gas in, it doesn't go anywhere. You were made by your Creator to live and serve and worship and rejoice and be content in Him and Him alone. And it's not that He's making you miserable, it's that there's no such thing as any other kind of happiness. It can't be. You can't find contentment apart from Him because you are created by Him to be happy in Him. I do think, come back around to our first question, I actually do think, as a cool side benefit of the whole Christian idea, that personal happiness is something you get in life, but only when you stop making it the goal. When you decide to give God glory and God alone, then you find happiness because you are, you're running on gasoline again. You are doing what you were meant to do. You are being renewed in the knowledge of the image of your Creator. You're what you were made to be. The best version of you is being who God made you to be and wanting what God made you to want. When your desires match His and your identity matches up with what He made for you to be, that's where you'll find happiness. And no other desire is ever going to lead to any kind of happiness or contentment. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. You might be tempted to think in verse 11 he changed subject. Personal morality, personal morality, personal morality, personal morality. Everybody get along. That's kind of strange. But they're connected in Paul's mind. Remember, all of your desires led to what? Anger, wrath, bickering, fighting. What happens if we let the new self take shape? What happened when we invite God in to make us who He wants us to be? crazy thing happens. Surprising result of changing our desires is changing the world. Every time a person becomes more Christ-like, the world becomes more Christ-like. Every time a person puts their affections and desires where they ought to be, the world gets a little bit more in tune with its created purpose and a little closer to what it needs to be. The most profound and simplest and productive thing you can do today to change the world, this is what we all want, right? Want to make the world a better place, is for you to start being a person in the image of Christ Jesus. For you to decide, instead of the world telling you where your affections and desires will be, your Creator will tell you that. And to start pointing your attention to things that actually matter. The fact is, we will find happiness in Christ above, Christ above all, that can be found nowhere else. It's not that He's denying it to us, it's that it just doesn't exist in any other place. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Father in heaven, we thank You for this day. Help us to trust You when You tell us that we were made to rest content in You. 
Help us to set your glory as our highest affection and desire you above all that this world has to offer. Help us at last to make Christ Lord of the last piece of the universe we have not offered to him ourselves and pray to him in Jesus' name. Amen.